Well, thanks to everyone who's shown up in person today and on Zoom. Uh, I'm Dan Slater. I'm the director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies. And very happy today to be uh, rounding out our, our academic year, final event of the year, with a very, a very big, long-awaited event. Uh, we have Mark Beisinger here from Princeton University to talk about his, his new book, uh, just released from Princeton University Press just a week ago, I believe. So literally hot off the presses. Like, there's still presses, I think, still out. I think actual paper copies of books still Still, still seem to exist, so that's that's promising. Um, so let me just briefly introduce uh, Mark uh, before we get started. So uh, Mark Beisinger is the Henry W. Putnam Professor in the Department of Politics at Princeton. He previously served on the faculties of the University of Wisconsin Madison and Harvard. Uh, at Wisconsin Madison, by the way, he had the honor of being my very first ever comparative politics professor um, several years ago, shall we say? So everything I've done wrong since then, we all know that with, what the the tap root of that is. Um, Mark's main field of interest are social movements, revolutions, nationalism, state building, and imperialism, with particular reference to the former Soviet Union, Russia, and the post-Soviet states. So I imagine some people might want to ask questions about other things going on in the world. I know that Mark is more than uh, ready and, uh, and prepared to answer questions on more recent events as well. So in addition to numerous articles and book chapters, uh, Mark is the author or editor of six books, most recently Historical Legacies of Communism in Russia and Eastern Europe, and his book, Nationalist Mobilization and the Collapse of the Soviet Union, won multiple awards, among them the APSA Award for Best Book Published in the United States on Government, Politics, or International Affairs. Although I also happen to know that it was not the book title that Mark himself had, had chosen. So despite him not being able to choose his own title for the book, it still managed to win. Imagine the awards it would have won if the Tides of Nationalism had actually been allowed to be the title of the book. Um, so. Uh, Mark's got this really fascinating book, The Revolutionary City, Urbanization and the Global Transformation of Rebellion. It's a, it's a product of a remarkable amount of data collection, both very deep in you know, case knowledge and, and global sweep. Uh, we're all going to learn a lot from the presentation. And so uh, please feel free, to, if you're on Zoom, to use the, uh, um, the Q&A function. I'll, uh, I'll curate that, people in person as well. And without any further ado, I'll turn it over to, to Mark to wrap things up. Thank you. Well, let me just get everything set here. Uh, thanks, Dan. And uh, Dan is living proof that you never know who's sitting out there in the audience uh, when you're teaching a class of 500 people. Uh, but uh, there are Dan Slaters who are sitting out there. Uh, I can assure you of that. Uh, so I want to thank Dan and the Weiser Center for inviting me uh, to talk about my new book, uh, The Revolutionary City. Uh, urbanization and the global transformation of rebellion is, as you can see here, uh, it's a pretty big book, uh, you know, good for doorstops and things like that. So I obviously am not going to be able to talk about everything in the book uh, today. I'm going to give you an overview of, of the book. I'm going to give you um, uh, some of the main findings of the book, and that's about all I'll be able to cover. So. I began research uh, on this project in 2010 uh, when I was invited to a workshop organized by historians at Yale uh, on blank spots in our knowledge of revolutions. And I was asked to address gaps in our knowledge about the relationship of violence uh, to revolution. I had previously written on the color revolutions, uh, on the role of violence during the Soviet collapse. And undoubtedly, like you, uh, I uh, believed that revolutions had been, been becoming significantly less deadly over time. Uh, but, you know, we had no data, no information to be able to say, well, how much less deadly had they become? When did they become less deadly? Uh, what factors might be associated with the fact that they became less deadly? And so uh, I ended up spending some time in the library to see how difficult it would be to collect that kind of information. And what I found convinced me of uh, what a knowledge of general global patterns of how people have challenged um, their rulers from below, how that has changed over time, what that, what that knowledge might come uh, to teach us. So the book essentially examines the evolution of political revolutions over more than a century. It treats revolution as a distinct mode of regime change from below. Uh, one that differs from coups, 
uh, or from foreign invasions aimed at regime change, like the Russians uh, have engaged in, U in Ukraine. Uh, in revolution, a government is laid siege to not by a foreign army or by its own military, but by its civilian population. And there is, of course, a vast literature on revolutions. The revolutionary city is somewhat distinct uh, in uh, its global scope, uh, the scope of its inquiry, its attempt to theorize the city uh, as a spatial site for revolt, uh, its focus on both revolutionary processes and the consequences of revolution. Uh, it also has a kind of multidisciplinary and multi-method approach, and it brings to bear uh, some new sources of information on the study of revolution. So the book is based in part on a data set that I collected of 345 revolutionary episodes from around the world uh, from 1900 to 2014. Uh, there are really no comparable uh, global records of revolution, though that kind of information I think has been sorely needed to identify global trends as well as to be able to place into context uh, specific uh, cases of revolution. Um, the book also utilizes a series of unusual public opinion surveys uh, probing individual level uh, participation in four uh, revolutions. The Orange Revolution, the Tunisian Revolution, the Egyptian Revolution, and the Euromaidan Revolution. Uh, the Middle East data comes from the Arab Barometer uh, surveys. Uh, the other information comes from uh, surveys that were done by uh, the Academy of Sciences uh, in, in Ukraine. Um, so those revolutions represent examples of the new urban uh, revolutionary repertoire that plays a central role in the book and has grown more common uh, around the world in recent decades. You know, it's rare to have a detailed systematic record of the attitudes, behaviors, and backgrounds of those participating in a revolution because most of what we know about those who participate uh, in revolutions has traditionally come from lists of people who are arrested or people who have died in, in revolution, and the information contained uh, in those lists tend to be, tends to be very thin. Uh, these surveys have a lot of detail. They have a lot of detail on all aspects of behavior, even whether uh, in one, you know, one of the surveys, two of the surveys, on whether they went to the gym last week. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's not only quite uh, thick in terms of the type of knowledge that it provides, but it allows us to compare individuals who participated in revolution with other members of society. And that's rather unusual as well. And it does it for, because we have these various surveys, it does it across, uh, you know, four different revolutions. Finally, the book uses, um, you know, extensive case material uh, drawn from numerous revolutions around the world in order to drill down uh, to the events and interactions uh, within revolutions and the spaces within re which revolutions unfold. Uh, so given time constraints, I'm not going to be able to talk about that material today, but I can assure you it's in the book. So the book is essentially about uh, how the concentration of people, power, and wealth in cities has affected the incidents, practice, and consequences of political revolutions. And as you know, the scale of urbanization over the past century has been nothing less than spectacular. Uh, in 1900, 13% of the world's population was urban, uh, and only 13 cities uh, around the world had more than a million inhabitants. By 2014, by the end of the book, uh, the time covered by the book, 54% of the world's population was urban, with 548 uh, cities around the world having a million inhabitants. Now, as the book argues, this transformation has had a profound effect on the ways in which people have come to challenge regimes from below. And it played a major role in rendering obsolete revolution's most theorized form, that is social revolutions, uh, which were rooted in what Theta Scotchpole called agrarian bureaucratic society. Uh, in Scotchpole's uh, classic formulation, agrarian bureaucratic society was a social formation in which control over and extraction of resources from peasants uh, depended on coordination between a semi-bureaucratic state and a landed uh, upper class. Most theories of social revolution revolved around some aspect of this agrarian bureaucratic society. 
and the conditions under which it produced revolution. However, as I describe in the book, uh, by the late 20th century, this agrarian bureaucratic world had largely uh, faded under the impact of urbanization, development, and political change. Now, at the same time, uh, urbanization gave rise to uh, the growth of revolution in cities, as I'll show you shortly, and to new patterns of urban revolt. So prior to 1985, as you can see here, prior to 1985, 70% of revolutionary episodes in cities were armed. Since 1985, 73% of revolutionary episodes in cities have been unarmed. So revolutions, a revolution in cities today has come to be based more on the power of numbers uh, than the power of arms, uh, what I call in the book the urban civic repertoire. The book explores uh, the rising incidence of these urban civic revolutions, how they fueled a growth in revolutionary contention around the world, and the increased odds uh, of opposition success that they've brought about, uh, as well as the processes that they involve uh, and the consequences that they uh, effect. So to tie all this together, um, I develop a spatial theory of revolution rooted in the differences between revolutionary processes in cities and revolutionary processes in the countryside. So these have much to do with different population densities, uh, terrains and built environments, social networks, uh, but they're also <clears throat> closely related to the role of cities as centers of state power, centers of state and economic power. So revolutionary challenges in cities take place precisely where the coercive power of the state is strongest, uh, rendering them highly vulnerable to repression. But the strategic advantages of regimes in cities are offset uh, to some extent by the vulnerabilities of regimes in cities. Uh, they are vulnerable due to the thickened presence of the nerve centers of governance. Um, which is what revolutionaries ultimately want to capture. Um, or nerve centers of governments, government and nerve centers of commerce. So the ultimate goal of all revolutions is to take those uh, centers of power. And in this sense, proximity to uh, centers of revolt, uh, excuse me, proximity of re revolt to centers of state power uh, not only magnifies the stakes and risks of revolutions for rebels, uh, it also magnifies the stakes and risks of revolution for regimes. So I refer to this uh, repression-disruption trade-off associated with proximity uh, to regime centers of power as the proximity dilemma in revolution, and I utilize it as a basic framework uh, for understanding revolutionary processes and how they have evolved over time. So a somewhat analogous trade-off actually exists in nature, uh, what evolutionary biologists uh, call the growth versus predation risk trade-off. And I apologize for the bloody character of some of those pictures there. Uh, but essentially, the growth versus predation risk trade-off uh, says that the most efficient sites for feeding are simultaneously the most dangerous sites for falling to predators. Uh, that is, predators gather at the same places uh, that, uh, you know, animals want to eat at. Um, and individual members of a species navigate this trade-off differently. Over time, however, learning and natural selection lead to adjustments in behavior, adjustments in behavior to balance the risks and rewards. So animals may, for example, alter where they, uh, at where and how long they feed or the timing of feeding. Uh, they might engage in herding or migratory behaviors. Uh, they might devote a portion of their feeding time to vigilance. Natural selection can also lead towards developing um, certain special camouflage uh, characteristics or escape capabilities. So the repression disruption trade-off in revolution has some similar aspects to it. It's not exactly the same, but it has some similar aspects to it. Um, you know, in revolution, uh, that trade-off can similarly be, be managed by spatial relocation. For instance, by moving further away from government centers of power, uh, a uh, revolutionary opposition can better avoid government repression. But they do that at the expense of their disruptive efficiency. 
The repression, repression disruption trade-off can also be managed through learning behavior, uh, specifically through tactical choice by regimes and oppositions, and tactics that increase an opposition's ability to disrupt or decrease its exposure to a regime's repressive capacity are likely to be more efficient at inducing regime change, while government tactics that increase an opposition's exposure, uh, opposition's exposure to, uh, uh, to a regime's repressive capacity or decrease its ability to disrupt are likely to be more effective at repressing revolutionary challenges. And finally, uh, like the effects of climate change on natural selection, the slope of the repression disruption trade-off function itself can be affected by structural changes in the environment that push it in a more favorable uh, direction for regimes uh, or for oppositions. Uh, in the diagram, you can see uh, there are different trade-off functions that are there. These would be trade-off functions x1 or x2 as opposed to trade-off function x0, just as examples that are there. So these types of structural changes occur as a result of changes in the environment that render oppositions uh, uh, more or less exposed to regime repression or regimes more or less vulnerable to opposition disruption. Changes like shifts in the nature of political and economic power or evolving social structures or networks, or new technologies of rebellion or counterinsurgency, new forms of communication, shifting currents of geopolitics. And as I argue in the book, these structural changes are usually most intensely felt in cities, where governments and oppositions are more exposed uh, to technological innovations, changes in the character of government, and global economic and geopolitical forces. But I also argue that urbanization has also altered the repression disruption trade-off more directly by concentrating large numbers of people in close proximity to centers of power, connecting them in new ways, and producing new spaces and social forces used for challenging regimes. Now, as I show in the book, uh, the proximity dilemma has shaped revolutionary contention in some profound ways. For example, lethal violence has opposite effects in rural and urban revolutions. In rural revolutions, more lethal violence is associated with a higher likelihood of opposition victory. In cities, precisely the opposite is true. Armed insurrections are more effective in the countryside, where rebels can hide from government retaliation, but as Engels, uh, already recognized in 1820, excuse me, 1895, and the quote that I uh, provide here, in cities, armed insurrections exposed revolutionaries to the full repressive capacity of the state, with rebels generally outgunned, uh, outnumbered, and outmatched by government forces. And this contextualized aspect of violence is one of the major points I think that's missed in Chenoweth and Stephan's uh, study of championing, championing uh, the superiority, the unqualified superiority of nonviolent tactics. So the repression disruption trade-off is also one of the key reasons why social revolutions, which until the early 20th century had occurred almost exclusively as armed rebellions in cities, uh, came to be waged predominantly from the countryside by the middle of the 20th century. So as the state's firepower increased, the old-fashioned way of making social revolution through armed revolt in cities had a low rate of success, but beginning in the 1920s, and especially during the Cold War, a ruralization of social revolution took place as social revolutionaries migrated to the countryside where they used distance uh, from government centers and rough terrain uh, to hide from government retaliation. So essentially, Social revolutionaries traded off uh, capacity to dis disrupt uh, directly for safety from government repression. And as a result, peasants, uh, who were once thought to be reactionary and focused entirely on access to land, became the new social force underpinning social revolution. The proximity dilemma also helps explain why numbers actually don't matter that much for the outcomes of rural revolutions. So scaling up in rural revolutions is difficult given low population densities, but crowds in the countryside also don't present much of a direct threat to regimes as they're located far from 
government nerve centers of power. By contrast, large crowds uh, uh, aren't only easier to assemble in cities, but they also threaten regimes more directly. Uh, large unarmed revolts in cities can potentially provoke defections from a regime's coalition, fend off regime repression, uh, as governments are reticent to shoot into large urban crowds due to the visibility of such acts and the dangers of backlash mobilization in, pro in close proximity to government nerve centers of power. So if armed revolutions in cities face a low probability of success due to the overwhelming coercive power of the state, revolutions in cities that rely on the power of numbers have performed better, as I show in the book. But as I also show, there are diminishing returns to numbers in cities, and it's only really at extremely large numbers that the odds truly tip in favor of revolutionary oppositions. Now, essentially, uh, the movement of hundreds of millions of people in cities over the past century uh, rendered possible new repertoires for challenging regimes in cities based on the power of numbers rather than the power of arms. As urbanization proceeded, the ability to mobilize exceptionally large numbers in cities grew more feasible, affecting the repression disruption uh, trade-off function. So take, for instance, the city of Kiev, uh, which experienced multiple revolutionary uprisings over the past 120 years, and which, of course, is sadly under uh, bombardment uh, by Russian, the Russian military. Uh, but during the revolution of 1905, uh, the population of Kiev could not have carried out the kind of massive mobilizations characteristic of the Orange Revolution in Kiev a century later. The size of the city uh, in 1905, 300,000, was simply too small for generating the kinds of massive crowds necessary for protecting protesters against government repression and exerting leverage through the power of numbers. But by 2004, Kiev was a major metropolitan center of 2.5 million people. That is more than eight times its population in 1905. And this provided a propitious base for mobilizing crowds of up to a million people in the Orange Revolution. As I detail in the book, uh, there were other reasons why the power of numbers was not an available strategy before the late 20th century. Governments at the beginning of the 20th century were significantly more likely to ride over or shoot into unarmed crowds than governments are today, making unarmed rebellion in cities a very risky affair. In the first half of the 20th century, deaths in unarmed rebellions in cities were on average six times greater than they were in the post-Cold War period. As a result of that, uh, participants in revolu revolutionary demonstrations in cities uh, were frequently forced to arm themselves in order to protect themselves against government attack. The widespread application of so-called non-lethal technologies of crowd control from the middle of the 20th century onwards, and I trace that in the book, uh, this greatly reduced the fatalities in urban revolution and made unarmed re uh, revolt in cities more feasible. And technologies for coordinating large crowds in the early 20th century were also primitive and severely limited in their reach, it wasn't until the Nazis uh, applied sound amplification to street rallies in the 1930s that people could actually hear speakers at a distance of more than 10 meters. Um, also, of course, due to the constraint, uh, constraints of communication systems, revolutionary movements in cities tended to rely on highly localized uh, neighborhood and factory networks, which also limited uh, the size of mobilizations. But by the late 20th century, as we know, technological innovations and the prol proliferation of large, resourced, highly networked populations in close proximity to the state's nerve centers of power altered the possibilities for making urban revolution through the power of numbers, tilting this repression disruption function in favor of urban oppositions. So that's, in essence, what I call in the book the urban civic repertoire. That is, uprisings that seek to overthrow abusive governments by mobilizing as many people as possible in central urban spaces, aiming at regime change through the power of numbers rather than through armed rebellion, street fighting, strikes, or urban rioting. Since 1985, Urban civic revolutions have constituted two-fifths of all revolutionary episodes around the world and three-fifths of all urban revolutions, and they've become 
uh, in fact, the most prevalent form of revolution in the world today. So as people, uh, power, and wealth shifted to cities, so too did the phenomenon of revolution. So prior to 1985, only 45% of revolutionary episodes occurred in cities. Uh, since 1985, more than two-thirds of revolutionary episodes have. Uh, as revolution has become a predominantly urban phenomenon. Moreover, the societies experiencing revolutions are profoundly different from the past. Uh, from 1900 to 1980, the level of urbanization uh, among societies experiencing revolutions rose by a total of only 10 percentage points over that 80-year period. Uh, in the 1970s, they were on average less than 20% urban and they lagged far behind the average level of urbanization of the rest of the world. But by uh, the beginning of the 1980s, the level of urbanization of societies experiencing revolution grew at an exponential rate uh, to the point that by the 2010s, it exceeded 50%, uh, approximating the global average. <clears throat> so contemporary urban revolutions have been associated with a different set of social forces than social revolutions. Not peasants, but the urban middle class uh, has participated disproportionately, uh, usually with sizable contingents of other urban groups, such as skilled workers, small business owners, students, and the unemployed. So by bringing, uh, excuse me, I think I skipped one here. Nope. Yeah, by bringing uh, numbers, large numbers closer to the nerve centers of power by creating, uh, actually this is, this is not the one I wanted, this, yes it is, this is the one I wanted, sorry. By bringing uh, these large numbers uh, closer to the nerve centers of power, by creating uh, cities of sufficient size for oppositions to be able to utilize the power of numbers, by connecting uh, these people together in new ways, by producing new, the new urban space social forces participating in revolution, and even by producing the new spaces in which they operated, urbanization led to a growth in the frequency of revolution around the world. Right? Um, and as I show in the book, uh, that increase has been driven in particular by the proliferation of urban revolutions, and specifically by urban civic uh, revolutions uh, relying on the power of numbers. So much of the book is devoted to understanding the implications of this return uh, to revolution to cities uh, and the rise of the urban civic uh, repertoire. So for instance, as the proximity dilemma might anticipate, rural revolutions and to a lesser extent uh, social revolutions are more closely associated with state weakness and in particular with my, what Michael Mann uh, called the infrastructural power of the state, that is the ability of states uh, or lack of ability to penetrate their own territories. Urban and urban civic revolutions, by contrast, aren't as affected by weak infrastructural power as they occur exactly where the state is strongest. They don't hide from state power. Uh, they actually confront state power directly. In one of the book's chapters, I develop a probabilistic structural model of the onset of urban civic revolutions. I use that model to show that the factors that map onto urban civic revolutions do not map onto social revolutions uh, or other types of revolutions or even other forms of political instability, such as military coups. And this confirms what Scotchpole actually said in, in her book, if you read it carefully, she said, uh, that no universal theory of the causes of revolution is possible simply because of the diversity of purposes to which revolution has been put, the varied social forces involved, and the changing world historical circumstances under which revolutions occurred. So unlike social revolutions, which were driven by poverty, land inequality, and state infrastructural weakness, contemporary urban uh, revolutions are more closely related to the coercive and predatory powers of the state, uh, they've been much more sensitive to regime type and have generally materialized against regimes that were more autocratic, uh, more personalist, more repressive, and more corrupt than those experiencing social revolutionary contention. So across the world, urban dwellers have shown particular concern about government corruption. 
World values surveys, for instance, show that city dwellers are much less likely to believe that it's justifiable to bribe an official than are inhabitants of rural areas. And that relationship is particularly strong in large cities, in cities larger than 500,000 people. And viewed in this light, it's hardly surprising that many of the grievances that permeate urban civic revolutions revolve around reclaiming the public sphere from corrupt, despotic, arbitrary government. Essentially, as societies urbanized and moved in closer proximity to centers of state power, and as states proliferated and consolidated, the state came to matter more in people's lives. In cities, populations came into more regular contact with the state, including the state's unequal capacities uh, for predation and corruption. Now, I also use this probabilistic model uh, to assess the roles played by structure and agency in the outbreak of urban civic revolutions. Uh, the model actually correctly identifies above average risk for more than 80% of the cases in which urban civic revolutions actually occurred. Uh, so clearly, urban civic uh, revolutionary contention is a structured phenomenon. It's structured, it occurs mostly where we would expect it to occur. But this structural model seriously overpredicts revolutions, as I show, uh, even in the presence of triggering events that could have set revolutions off in those structured cases. So through a series of 16 case studies, I use the model's prediction of risks, or pred its predictions of risk, to assess why revolution did or did not emerge in specific cases, uh, when the risk of revolution was high, uh, and uh, why it occasionally uh, emerged where the risk of revolution was low, uh, and uh, why, you know, demonstrating uh, why it didn't emerge in cases in which the risk of revolution was high, uh, even in the presence of structuring, um, uh, excuse me, triggering events. And what this analysis shows is the critical role played by regime opposition interactions in the materialization of revolutionary contention. Uh, rather than earthquakes or wildfires, which are the typical analogies that are used in the study of revolutions, I liken revolutions to hurricanes. Um, that's why I have that picture up there. So I, I don't know how much you know about hurricanes, but they typically begin as small tropical disturbances over the ocean due to the interaction between warm surface water and the upper atmosphere. Uh, only a small proportion of these disturbances ever develop into storms, one to two percent. Um, only half of those storms ever develop uh, to the level of hurricanes, hurricane level winds. Um, and this process, this outcome, is largely a product of interactive processes, in particular vertical wind shear. You wouldn't think it, but you know, too strong of a wind shear, too strong of vertical wind breaks these storms up, and they never become hurricanes. Uh, so this outcome, uh, uh, you know, um, is, is interactive in character, and also many hurricanes never of course, uh, reach land. They die out at sea. Others slam into coastal regions, causing enormous damage. And while there's a seeming randomness to the emergence of and trajectory of each storm, hurricanes are clearly structured phenomena. Um, over the long run, in fact, you know, distinct patterns emerge to hurricanes. They occur, for instance, more frequently in the Atlantic Basin. Uh, and as a result of the warming of the oceans, uh, they've been growing more frequent over time. Just as I show, revolutions have been growing more frequent over time. So I argue that this combination of structural conduciveness and uncertain emergence is how we should think about revolutions and revolutionary episodes, the emergence of revolution. Uh, revolutions emerge probabilistically uh, with a certain risk involved, but not with automaticity. Uh, and they largely occur in places where we would expect them to be. Uh, but there are plenty of instances in which they fail to develop, even in the presence of conducive structural conditions uh, and potential triggers. Dynamic interactions between regimes and oppositions play the critical role in determining whether this tropical disturbance grows into a full-scale hurricane. So the book then delves further down into the revolutionary episode. It dissects the processes that occur within urban revolutions and how these compare with revolutionary contention in the countryside. 
And because proximity to centers of state power heightens the costs and risks involved in revolution, it turns urban revolutions into highly condensed conflicts that take place over the course of days and weeks rather than over years, as, as is true of rural revolutions. And this compression of time in revolution, what I call in my book on the Soviet collapse, thickened history, um, it creates significant information problems for regimes and oppositions, similar to what is called in chess Zeitnot, or time trouble. Um, that is, the errors that players make due to the pressure of the clock. In rural revolutions, battles between rebels and governments uh, you know, have a punctuated character to them. Uh, they also can be mistake prone, they can be confusing, though the mistakes that are made in rural revolutions usually have to do with the isolation of the players rather than to the speed of the play. But rural revolutions are forgiving. They're forgiving due to the remoteness of the state and the impenetrability of, of terrain. In most instances, those provide a buffer, a buffer for rebels and regimes to recover from their mistakes. But in urban revolutions, errors occur in close proximity to the state's concentrated coercive capacity and its nerve centers of government. And I show through numerous examples in the book that that heightens their impact on outcomes, on revolutionary outcomes. In urban revolutions, not only are errors frequent, uh, but their consequences are also direct and immediate. So the book also contrasts the spatial uh, dimensions, the spatial dimensions of rural revolts with urban armed revolts, uh, and those of urban civic revolts uh, based on the power of numbers. So in contrast to urban armed revolts, which treat, treat the cityscape as if it were rough terrain uh, and use it to provide protection against government collapse, urban civic revolutions attempt to take advantage of the spaces between buildings. Uh, the spaces between buildings, the empty space of the public square and the boulevard for mobilizing large numbers to disrupt political and commercial life. They don't hide from government repression, rather they occur in full view of the nation and the world and of course in full view of the police uh, in centrally located public spaces in close proximity to centers of power. Visibility is one of the features of the urban environment that those revolts seek to exploit by using the power of moral shocks to mobilize large numbers in backlash against regime repression. With the rise of television and internet, visuality and simultaneity and transnationality have become increasingly central to revolutionary processes, uh, particularly in urban spaces. In 1917, Lenin, who was then in Zurich, uh, learned of the events of, the Rus of Russia's February 1917 revolution, essentially the day that the revolution ended. By contrast, during the Tunisian revolution in 2010, Many of the informational sites that were used uh, in the revolution were managed overseas uh, and through the magic of social media, uh, Tunisians and the rest of the world could witness revolutionary protests and acts of government repression practically in real time. So as states proliferated and consolidated and as urbanization proceeded, large open spaces in proximity to centers of power spread throughout the world, especially in capital cities. Uh, Kiev's Maidan, for instance, developed into a vast revolutionary space in significant part due to the destruction of the city during World War II and the ways in which the communist regime refashioned the area into a staging ground uh, for glorification of the Soviet state. And I talk about the book of, in, in the book about the discovery of Maidan as a revolutionary space. It didn't just happen, it had to be discovered in some ways. So in the book, I examine uh, the making and unmaking of this revolutionary public space over time. I explore how the shape, location, availability, and symbolic value of public space affect the manner in, wi of, uh, in which interactions between regimes and oppositions and revolutionary contention unfold. Uh, you know, as modern uh, rural counterinsurgency doctrine emphasizes in rural revolutions, it's not control over space uh, that determines the outcome of, of uh, conflicts, but rather control over so-called hearts and minds. 
uh, that is control over the political loyalty of the people who inhabit that space. By contrast, in urban civic revolutions that rely on the power of numbers, outcomes are largely about a struggle for control over public space a struggle for control over public space, particularly in close proximity to nerve centers of power. And as I show in the book, uh, the closer an urban civic uh, revolutionary opposition is able to come to those nerve centers of power, the more likely it is to leverage success. There is a relationship, uh, a spatial relationship uh, that exists. Uh, I also explore the ways in which regimes have attempted to insulate themselves, to insulate themselves uh, from urban civic revolutionary challenges by keeping those challenges far away from government nerve centers of power by trying to push them to the periphery of cities um, uh, with the idea that with lacking that visibility, lacking that leverage, they will be able to fade away, and often, usually, they are. Um, so this spatial dimension of, uh, of revolutionary uh, contention, I think, has not been emphasized uh, as much as it should be within the literature. So the book then descends still further uh, to the level of the individuals participating in urban civic revolutions. It uses uh, the surveys from Egypt, Tunisia, uh, and uh, uh, Ukraine. And as I show, revolutionary processes that concentrate in hundreds of thousands of people into central urban spaces in a matter of days or weeks, as urban civic revolutionary revolutions do, they necessarily draw on a wide variety of grievances and political forces. And to maximize numbers in a concentrated period of time, uh, these revolutions occur over days and weeks, uh, not over even you know, months and years. Uh, to maximize numbers in that period of time, uh, these revolution, uh, revolutions typically construct a broad negative coalition. Constructed in a makeshift manner, they pull in all who favor removal of the incumbent regime, irrespective of purpose or political belief. Uh, they rely on hastily assembled coalitional leaderships, sometimes no leadership at all, uh, and an inclusive civic nationalism that is supposed to appeal to as many people as possible, and broadly civic uh, minimalist demands of reclaiming state power from corrupt and abusive regimes. This is a kind of least common denominator that can attract as many participants as possible. Unlike social revolutions, uh, typically led by hierarchical organizations, the leaderships of urban civic revolutions, to the extent that they exist, have neither the desire nor the opportunity to socialize participants into a common set of values. The surveys show that participants in these revolutions were much more diverse in their political identities and opinions on key public policy issues uh, than either those who supported the revolution but didn't participate and those or those who opposed the revolution. So urban civic revolutions are often interpreted as democratic revolutions, uh, but there are a number of reasons why I don't call them that. Uh, and, you know, for one thing, there have been many revolutions uh, espousing liberal aims uh, around the world uh, that didn't rely on the power of numbers. And in fact, revolutions espousing liberal aims up through the middle of the 20th century were armed, almost all armed. By, but more importantly, uh, as the surveys show, corruption and economic issues were actually the most frequently cited uh, reasons, uh, the most fre frequently cited by participants uh, in these revolutions as the reasons why they participated in them. Uh, while the desire for political freedoms was cited by only a minority. Now, accordingly, uh, most participants, in fact, demonstrate a weak commitment to democratic values. So, for instance, 66% of Orange Revolution participants and 62% of Euromaidan participants agreed with the statement, quote, several strong leaders can do more for our country than laws and discussions. 33% of Orange Revolution participants and 52% of Euromaidan uh, Revolution participants believed that Ukraine, uh, only, only that number believed Ukraine needed a multi-party system. Obviously, I mean, a multi-party system, pretty much of a core feature of a democracy. And when asked to identify uh, the two top features of a democracy, 63% of participants in the 2011 Egyptian Revolution named providing basic food items or narrowing the gap between rich and poor as the most important features of a democracy. 
while only 10% named the opportunity to change one's government or freedom uh, to criticize the government. So in short, urban civic revolutions are better understood uh, as revolutions against repressive and abusive government rather than revolutions for democracy. They are more about what people are struggling against than what they are struggling for. So generally speaking, revolutions don't produce democracies. It's what happens after revolution that determines whether a democracy develops. And one of the key contributions of the book, I think, is its systematic comparison of what happens after revolutions. It compares the effects of social revolutions and urban civic revolutions on political order, economic growth, inequality, political freedoms, and government accountability. Uh, for instance, I show that successful urban civic revolutions do lead to substantial improvements in political freedoms uh, in their wake, especially compared to their pre-revolutionary regimes. But as I also show, uh, these achievements fall short of the average levels for electoral democracies minimally defined uh, over the course of the past century, averaged over the course of the past century. And they tend to deteriorate somewhat over time, over subsequent years. Uh, moreover, uh, in terms of the rule of law, uh, these regimes fall far short of the average levels exhibited by electoral democracies. Most importantly, uh, urban civic revolutions don't push aside the state, but rather they inherit the pre-revolutionary state intact uh, with all its embedded relationships of corruption. Uh, as a result, corruption remains at very level, uh, high levels uh, after these revolutions, and as you can see here, uh, not that different from pre-revolutionary uh, levels of corruption, which usually were one of the main causes of these revolutions in the first place, uh, practically identical with levels of corruption in failed urban civic revolutions, and far higher than the average level of corruption across all electoral democracies minimally defined. So urban civic revolutions also tend to generate, as I show in the book, uh, higher levels of economic inequality and sluggish economic growth, the difficult uh, atmosphere in which to have to govern. Finally, uh, because urban civic revolutions are extremely compact in time and involve a hastily constructed negative coalition, they produce post-revolutionary governments that are more fractious uh, and less durable than governments brought to power by social revolutions. Uh, as you can see here, from a survival analysis of post-revolutionary regimes, revolutions that occur within a highly compressed period of time generally produce post-revolutionary regimes that don't last as long as po in power. And this is a relationship that transcends the ideology, the particular ideology of, a, of uh, the revolution. It's across all uh, successful revolutions. So. Uh, three out of every five successful urban civic revolutions experienced two months or less of revolutionary contention. So statistically speaking, these new regimes had less than a 50-50 chance of surviving for more than six years. So in this way, urban civic revolutions not only lead to different post-revolutionary outcomes than social revolutions, but their effects are more uncertain and more ambiguous uh, than those of social revolutions. Okay, uh, this gives you a taste of some of the things that I deal with in the book. Uh, you know, my goals in writing this book were to explain how and why revolutions have evolved over time, uh, to develop a theory of revolution that's relevant for our predominantly urban world, uh, and to bring to bear new forms of information on revolutions that would help us understand revolutionary phenomena in a new way. And hopefully I've been able to convey some of that to you in my talk today and to pique your interest in learning more. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Mark. Um, so the, the Q&A is open on Zoom and also here in the, in the audience. Um, I have the microphone, so I'll go ahead and ask the first question. Um, so to the question of why urbanization, so of, you know, of revolutionary activity, why have things moved in this urban direction? There were kind of two things I was thinking about that at least seemed underemphasized in your talk that I think 
I, I doubt you would disagree, but I wonder if they might deserve more <laughs> emphasis. So one is, I mean, to borrow your own metaphor of tides and thinking about diffusion, here, right? So in a way, what I'm most puzzled by is maybe the lack of, or the, the paucity of urban revolutions during the Cold War, for instance, right? Um, and so why was there so much rural, you know, leftist insurgency during the Cold War? And the, the balsells Calivas argument has been that, you know, there's something about the Cold War that kind of incubated these, um, these, these, these rural um, leftist insurgencies. But I always sort of thought that in a way gets it backwards in the sense that what made the Cold War was rural insurgency, particularly in Asia and particularly in China. So I wonder to what extent there's a demonstration effect and that when we think about forms of revolution after 1949, that China looms extremely large, then Cuba both following on China and then in Latin America, Cuba itself looming very, very large. And so a big part of the story is the demonstration effect of 1949 especially, and that what we see after the Cold War is the demonstration effect of 1989 especially. The fall of the Berlin Wall, just the drama of, these, of, of, of demonstration effects. And that could be, I guess, to what degree is this title, like your earlier, your earlier book? Mm -hmm. and, and, and to what degree is that part of the story that might be, or maybe I, I missed that, but I, I wonder if that's part of it. And then... I guess relatedly, and you mentioned briefly the kind of different attitudes of urban and rural dwellers in general, but I really had to wonder here, there's, to what your book says about what I think is one of the most important features of you know, global life at the moment, which is the polarization between urban and rural areas. I mean, anywhere in the world you look, basically, um, just the, so much of what's happening with polarization is between urban and rural. And I guess I wonder is, is that something at a deeper level that's underpinning part of this? Like, so maybe whether it's about technology or simply about the, the rising numbers in cities, something is going on that's making urban and rural more polarized. And I wonder if some of those features that might be driving that might also be driving why it's the city that turns against the regime and, and shows these. So it could be pr maybe not democratic attitudes, but a certain set of progressive attitudes, as you said, anti-corruption. How might this help book help us think about this enormous question, I think, of urban-rural polarization right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I agree, agree with uh, your observation about the role of diffusion. Uh, plays, it plays an important role. Uh, but diffusion doesn't happen outside of structural conditions, right? It's not something that's totally torn from it. Uh, and uh, one still has to explain why you have this rural-urban uh, diversity that occurs and why it is that social revolution moved off to the countryside in the first place, right? So, uh, so uh, you know, diffusion uh, is a part of the story and I do talk about it in the book. It's not, you know, it's not the central theme of this book, uh, but it is also connected with urbanness as well because, um, you know, diffusion is more likely to take place within an urban context than it is within a rural context, or it takes place in a much slower sort of, uh, you know, less frenzied way uh, to the extent that it occurs, you know, in rural revolutions, across rural revolutions. But I still think it's, it's, it's more predominantly, it is associated with urban revolutions, um, as I, I do actually show that in the book. Um, so, um, and, the, and geopolitical circumstances obviously matter enormously. So, uh, and I do emphasize that in the book, that that's one of the frames within which this is all happening. Um, and I'm not trying to claim an exclusive causal rela relationship for urbanization. Um, you know, it's not, uh, I, be I believe in multi-causality and not in single causes. Uh, however, I'm trying to theorize that dimension of it uh, which uh, explains why it is that after the Cold War, revolutions were, or as the Cold War ended, actually actually precedes slightly the end of the Cold War, uh, but uh, as the, uh, the Cold War ended, why revolutions became a predominantly urban phenomenon, um, and how the tactics changed, which changed enormously, uh, which can't be explained entirely by either the Cold War or some ideological affinity between liberalism and the power of numbers because, as I said, uh, most liberal revolutions prior to the middle, middle of the 20th century were fought by arms. Um, so the second question is, you know, is a 
question that um, probably transcends the book to some extent. Um, you know, most of the urban civic revolutions that I describe occur within lower middle and middle income countries, uh, not in advanced, obviously in advanced industrial countries. Um, and a lot of the polarization between rural and urban has occurred in probably that up, somewhat more of that upper range of, uh, of countries. Uh, at least in, when we think about populism and de-democratization and the role of that urban, urban rural divide within it. Uh, but, I mean, you have places even like Guatemala where you have rural re revolutionary processes that took place, you know, in the, uh, during uh, the Cold War and even uh, continued after the Cold War, uh, peasant-based revolution, and now you have urban revolution, which is largely torn from this rural revolutionary process. Uh, it's a very different type of logic, different social forces. So the differences between city and countryside, even though, of course, there, there's, there are plenty of ties between the rural context and the urban context through migration, but uh, those are not necessarily the people who are always participating in these revolutions. And uh, you know, that, uh, that difference still exists even as these urban civic revolutions take, take off and social revolutions die out. And that actually kind of segues nicely to a, a question that, uh, that Rob Mickey from the Political Science Department acts on, uh, asks online, this question of urban-rural connection. So Rob says, what a stunning book. I should say that first. <laughs> Um, and he's wondering what impact, if any, urban civic revolutions have in altering the possibilities of political tension or even revolution in the countryside. Do these urban revolutions soak up energy, potential urban allies for those discontented in the countryside, in effect making rural contention less likely, or if it occurs, less successful? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of the processes that led to the decline of social revolution fed into the rise of, of urban civic revolution. You had a concentration of power in cities uh, the rise and consolidation of states, um, you know, so a lot of social revolutions were connected with independence or had a relationship with the years, you know, immediately after independence. Uh, the urban civic revolutions occur, have, have the opposite relationship with the number of years after independence. Uh, they have to do more with consolidation, they have to do with, the, with uh, predatory, as I was saying, predatory power. But you know, there, the massive migrations of people to cities uh, has, to some extent, um, helped to undermine the revolutionary potential in the countryside. Uh, so urbanization undermines it in, in a number of ways. First of all, it severs the relationship between land and revolution in some ways, or, or land and incomes, let's put it that way. So uh, rural families have come much more to depend upon urban economies and th uh, through particularly uh, you know, remuneration and, and um, sen sending of money back to the countryside rather than access to land. Um, and that, you know, so land, as I show in the book, and land inequality is very closely associated with uh, the outbreak of, of urban, or, uh, of, excuse me, of, of social revolution. Uh, so there's also been, of course, a massive land reform that has occurred around the world. And then very large portions of the world, uh, China, Russia, uh, former Soviet Union, much of South, parts of Southeast Asia and so on, they wiped out their landowning classes they, uh, entirely. Uh, so, uh, so that, uh, you know, had effects. So social revolution and the fear of social revolution also diminished through fear of social revolution through land reform, diminished the threat of social, social revolution. Uh, uh, so uh, in all, all these ways, I think, uh, you know, also I just mentioned one thing about migration. The migration tends, tends to be, to cities tends to be males. Uh, they, they leave uh, the countryside, they go to the city, and it leaves the countryside being much more female, much older in many ways, and with a lower uh, revolutionary potential. So there are ways in which these, these connections occur. Perfect. Let's do I mean, one more on Zoom, and then uh, we'll open up to the audience here. Um, so a, I guess both a simple and very complicated question from Elena Gapova, who asks about the urban uprising in 2020 in Belarus. 
and, and this is, of course, outside the scope of your book and the data set, but it must have, as it unfolded, have been something you were watching closely. So can you comment on this event from the point of view of your theory and, and yeah. evidence? Yeah. So I, I think that that is a good example of, of the ways in which regimes have been learning about the urban civic repertoire in terms of ways of confronting it. So actually, <clears throat> since the end of the book, I mean, I have tracked revolutionary episodes around the world. I haven't coded them yet, but I have tracked them. They continue, uh, as I show in the concluding chapter on the future of the revolution, they continue to increase at a pretty significant pace in terms of episodes. Uh, however, the, the rate of success has declined. Um, and the rate of success has declined in part because regimes are learning ways they're learning ways to counter this urban civic uh, repertoire based on the power of numbers. One of the ways in which they have learned it is to wait it out, if they have the, the degree of coherence that they, you know, necessary to do that. So if they can uh, wait it out, uh, then ultimately those, uh, the civilian populations involved in urban revolution, because urban revolution is quite, you know, it's quite disruptive to, what lo to economies. It occurs exactly where uh, economic power is concentrated. Uh, you don't have to have strikes in order to have that effect. You know, in the Egyptian revolution, uh, the, uh, you know, money machines all ran out of money. Uh, there was, you know, things ran, ran out in the stores uh, and so on. So, uh, so if you can wait it out, um, populations ultimately tire. They begin to thin. Uh, sometimes they engage in violence. Uh, as a result of that, which makes it easier to uh, justify violent repression of them. Uh, but also, they become smaller and therefore easier to, to uh, repress. Uh, plus, I mean, the, the regime, uh, you know, the, the Lukashenko regime was quite brutal in going in and just sort of grabbing people and, you know, taking them to jail and torturing them. Uh, so it was it was one of the more brutal regimes to experience uh, this kind of revolutionary contention. And as I show in the book, um, actually, you know, here you can get back to this. Those polity scores. The right. polity it, it's scores, in the, it's right? In the, you can right. see here. More so, the closed autocracy. So really, zone. you know, the, the, the regimes that are most vulnerable to, this is the onset rather than uh, to, um, to actually winning once, it onset, uh, once there's onset. But, uh, there's a somewhat similar relationship to to uh, to that for in terms of outcomes. There's this, you know the sweet spot is at the you know this lower middle end of the poly score, repressive, not even in the more open end of the of the polity scale, uh, but this this highly repressive you know portion of the polity scale, uh, the odds you know decline, obviously, and Belarus fits that description. Uh, May Hassan has a question. Thanks so much for this talk. It was really generative in thinking about different, or just thinking about and recognizing the importance of urban civic uh, revolutions uh, across the world. One of my questions builds off of the last Zoom question. And so repressive regimes always adapt to the innovative tactics of, of dissidents, of revolutionaries that are going on. And so the last uh, question asked about like, what are some, some of the tactical adaptations that they've done like during the movement? I kept wondering about some of the longer term adaptations. And so here I was thinking a lot about Jeremy Wallace's book about in China, because of the growth of all of these mega cities, the Chinese regime really pushing ruralization to try to get people out of cities to try to create multiple mega cities as opposed to just having like Shanghai and Beijing. And so I wanted to know what you thought some of the longer term trends for many of these, you know, the, these uh, <laughs> regimes that do see or ex probably, you know, they're not stupid, expect to see these types of revolution revolutions are. Yeah, I mean, a lot of their energy is devoted to so-called revolution proofing themselves, right? And we know that. Um, so, uh, Obviously, you know, the application of technology to uh, prevention of uh, revolution has, has now become a major trend. And, uh, you know, there was a time when um, digital technologies were disruptive to regimes. Uh, they still are disruptive, uh, potentially, but 
uh, you know, regimes have now um, begun, as, you, as we know, they've begun to employ digital technologies for other purposes of trying, uh, of identifying opposition, preventing opposition, um, and, and so on, and even, um, you know, with facial recognition, of course, that reaches a new level, potentially, especially when we're talking about revolutions that rely on the power of numbers. Um, so there's a technological dimension uh, that, uh, that is there. There's also, uh, I, as I detail in the book, you know, the spatial dimension of uh, controlling space in proximity to, to nerve centers of power. So when you look at a case like Iran, for instance, and the repression of the 2011, um, you know, protests that occurred in Iran, you know, what the regime did was essentially it, it, it drove the protests uh, to, the, to the periphery of the city and ultimately even to the rooftops of the city, right? It, they couldn't, people couldn't gather eventually. So this kind of control, and if you look at other cases like, I don't know, you know, Bahrain is another good example where, you know, they destroyed the space in which uh, the revolution occurred, they flattened it, they pushed it, they didn't just repress it, they, they pushed the protest, they allowed protests to occur out in, in the Shia suburbs, okay, to try to, uh, and waited until they had declined in size. The Putin regime, what they did was they created high, they've created Hyde Parks, or they did create Hyde Parks on the outskirts of uh, the center of the city, uh, saying you can protest there, you can't protest over here. Well, they were hardly used because they lacked the visibility, they lacked the, the power of proximity to centers of power, you know, protest in proximity to centers of power. So the spatial control is another sort of key tactic that regimes have now learned. Uh, they've learned well. Um, there, are, there are other uh, tricks and, and techniques that they do. They know that they can wait it out if they have the, the ability, the coherence to do it. And these regimes, you know, at this end, this, this lower end of the polity scale are more likely to be able to do that than the ones sort of more in the lower middle. Um, so let's, let's bring the economy into this a little bit. Yeah. Um, which is, so we have, we have a question from, uh, from Ben Bradlow, uh, which I want to build on a little bit. So, so he asks, how should we think about the role of demands for public goods in cities? Things like housing, water, sanitation, electricity, health, education, in the repertoire of demands in urban rebellion. And just to give one example, just as I'm thinking about this, like in, in Hong Kong recently, we've had these you know, really massive urban revolutionary activity. There's a real debate about to what degree this is about, you know, kind of, you know, bread and butter issues, to what degree this is about, you know, the difficulty of youth accessing housing and the like, um, and so the economic side of it as well. So yeah. you gave the example, that really kind of amazing example from Egypt of how people think about what democracy is and, you know, um, food versus versus multi-party elections. I wonder if that's... A if reflection that's, so of the causes of the revolu of these revolutions. Right, and is that more, <laughs> like, that, that's, an, that's an amazing, like, sort of vignette from one of the cases. Is it your sense that might yeah. be more, more uniformly true, that a lot of what we're seeing is demands for, for economic change more than political change, perhaps? So what I show in the book is it's not uniformly true. It's true in a, sub in a significant subset of cases. Uh, and neoliberalism has played into uh, these urban civic revolutions to some extent in a subset of cases uh, through contraction of public services, uh, you know, the uh, ta taxation of, of uh, things, uh, you know, electricity rises, uh, food, food price rises, uh, things like that, which off have in many cases become touchstones for rebellion, but not in all cases. And in fact, there isn't even an, you know, there's not even a, a negative relationship in urban civic uh, revolutions. There's a pretty much of a flat relationship a very varied relationship, not, not statistically significant relationship with levels of economic growth in the year before uh, urban civic revolutions occur. That's because there's a lot of variation that's there. So you have patterns like in the Middle East uh, where, in fact, contraction of public services did play a role. And, then that, and that's the pattern in a number of cases. But in the case of Ukraine, for instance, you had economic growth taking place prior to the, to, uh, you know, the emergence of uh, revolution. So, uh, so <clears throat> yes, it, it does in a number of cases, but it's not the only pattern. Um, and 
Uh, but one thing I do show in the book, which is kind of interesting in terms of economics, and I, I have a, a section of my chapter on what happens after revolution uh, on the impact of revolutions on, on economies. Um, and that is, you know, uh, these urban civic revolutions, of course, have none of the deep, immediate impact uh, on economies like social revolutions do. And social revolutions, because they wipe out large amounts of population, uh, destroy property and, and capital, lead to emigration, they have very immediate, deep impacts on economies. Not so urban civic revolutions, but urban civic revolutions, when compared to matched cases, they have stagnating economies. Uh, they do not, they, they uh, have trouble producing economic growth in their wake. Um, and th this is part of the crisis that emerges after urban civic revolutions. That is, they can't, they don't satisfy, um, in many ways, the, the demands uh, that, that some of the economic demands uh, that in many cases help to give rise to revolution. So a good case is like Tunisia, where you know, you, it's clear that economics played into the, into the in initial re revolution. <laughs> But the new regime w has had, you know, difficult, or the new regime had difficulty uh, generating economic growth, and we know what ultimately has happened there. Uh, so, well, it seems like these are, I mean, these events are both sociologically complex, but also psychologically complex. So, it's like sociologically complex in the sense that clearly not everybody out in the streets is out for the same reasons. That's and right. then people who, if you're angry enough to go out in the streets, you're probably angry about more than one thing. So trying to pin these things down to one, uh, one master cause is going to be a <coughs> difficult thing to do with these, these kind of phenomena, for sure. Um, so to this point about the, the difficulty of kind of organizing things afterwards, um, the kind of organizing power once you've, once you've won it, um, that points to a question that Adam Casey asked. Um, and he's read the book, so he's, he's coming at this with a lot more knowledge of what you're arguing. Um, but he's pushing you a little bit on the question of the, the extinction of Leninist parties um, mm -hmm. and sort of the idea that uh, this is something that we're, we're, we're from not going to see anymore. And so a few examples he gives, he says he talks about the late Cold War rebellions in Africa, places like Namibia, Rwanda, Uganda, Ethiopia, Eritrea, South Sudan. More recently with the Islamic State has some similarities to a Leninist party. So do we think the Leninist party is really dead? Is there any way it might be revived? Um, clearly there are costs to the disorganization of current civic revolutions. And so we see any signs or indications there could be a return of, of the party or some kind of form of ongoing organization, if not the Leninist party, uh, that goes, can go from you know, toppling the regime to actually organizing things. And, and maybe do we have any more positive cases of this that we could draw on? Yeah, I'm afraid, uh, Adam, that I think the Leninist party is extinct, uh, is dead. Uh, and uh, there may be some examples of Leninist parties that are still out there engaged in their struggles. You know, we, we have Maoist parties that are out there engaged in their struggles. Uh, most of them are operating from rural areas. Certainly Leninist parties in cities are dead, and you know, they became terrorist organizations. As I demonstrate in the, er, in the book through a number of examples, uh, you know, they have great difficulty in trying to launch revolutions in cities because of the penetrative power, the, 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 the fact that they're doing it right where the state is the strongest. Uh, and, uh, you know, the example, one of the examples I use is the Brazilian Marxist Marighella, uh, who talked about, you know, using the city and the, the topography of the city uh, as uh, cover uh, from attack and knowing all the uh, corners and alleys and glens in order to escape, um, um, you know, the police detection. And as soon as he published this work, he was captured and killed by the police <laughs> in Sao Paulo. So, uh, or, you know, you can take the 19, 1916 uh, rebellion in, in Ireland. So it's very hard uh, for the for Leninist party to operate in, a, in an urban environment. Um, and, you know, what allowed it to happen perhaps in 1917, and here I'm just speculating, but, you know, was the disorganization of the revolution that had happened already before that, uh, that is the February Revolution. Uh, so uh, most, uh, you know, the, the, the record of Leninist parties in cities in the 1920s, 1919s, 19 teens and 20s was poor, other than in Russia. Uh, so, 
uh, they need, if they're to operate, they need to do it uh, away from the uh, centers of power. Right there, I mean, I think that their likelihood of victory is lowered uh, because of, um, you know, the, the difficulties of winning. And it may be in Africa that there are still parties that are out there struggling, and there may be some occasional liberation movements which win. They may seem somewhat different than, uh, somewhat similar to Leninist parties, but many of them are actually, they're somewhat different. That is, they try to create alliances across ethnic groups and so on. They are hierarchical, they are more, more hierarchical, but I don't think they're, that they're necessarily Leninist. Well, it also, you'd think that, I mean, as we move from to, into the, you know, just how many electoral authoritarian regimes they are, that's going to tend to generate a more electoral opposition. And so that points to the possibility that, if not a Leninist parties, um, that maybe other kinds of political parties. So there's the sort of this question, how can, how can these negative coalitions be made more positive? Yeah. You know, and so I'm thinking about Hagar and Kaufman's book here, where they put a lot of stress on, on labor unions, for instance, right? So labor unions or existing political parties, and certainly in a place like Indonesia, the, the, pre, the prior existence of political parties in the opposition was just enormously important, I think, in giving some level of um, kind of electoral preparedness and competitiveness and, and willingness to, to face electoral challenges from the opposition side in the 1998 um, you know, revolution there. And so is there any, so kind of pushing beyond Adam's question one more step, so if not Leninist parties, what if anything? Could it be unions? Could it be associations, political parties, in alliance with social movements? What, what might it be? Well, it may be that pop, populist movements end up producing a different type of revolutionary movement. Uh, you know, that's different, but not necessarily based on the power of numbers, right? Uh, so um, there's a, been a propensity to some extent for the power of arms, as we know. Uh, although that I, I don't think January 6 was a revolutionary movement. It was much more of what uh, in Latin America we call an alt or what's called an alt auto golpe, right, uh, self-coup. But, um, but here you can see, you know, one of the challenges of using labor unions is, of course, neoliberalism. <clears throat> and uh, here you can see uh, on, the, on the right that there's been a, a, a declining use of strikes, a declining use of strikes over time uh, in revolutionary contention and a rise of the demonstration as a form. And, you know, um, I also compare here on the left sort of what's the impact of using strikes but no demonstrations versus using demonstrations but no strikes. And as you can see, I mean, demonstrations, gathering numbers, large numbers in central urban spaces is much more effective. It's more effective in terms of producing uh, success than are, um, you know, just using strikes. Now, strikes could, can magnify, you know, the effect of... Um, the power of numbers. I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm just saying that there's, you know, the conditions for its use have declined over time, and so uh, labor on its own tends not to be sufficient for the kind of numbers that you need, that you need in order to contain a regime uh, through the power of numbers. Um, and strikes alone just don't don't work. So, um, you know, one of the points of the book is that revolution is, has been an evolving thing. It always has been an evolving thing since its invention in the 17th, 18th centuries, right? So, uh, and it's the purposes to which it's been put have been quite varied, uh, enormously varied. And uh, so uh, I fully suspect that it's going to continue to do so um, in response to not only you know, the major changes that, we're, we, that I talked about uh, in, the, in the lecture, uh, but also to new changes that emerge that I can't see or that we see only in their initial forms. Uh, certainly, you know, there is a, a question as to what's going to happen with populism and whether populism will eventually emerge. Uh, so far, it's been electoral, right? Solely, pretty much solely electoral and what happens when it gets evicted from power or uh, other, other sorts of uh, things like that. So we don't know what's going to happen uh, to revolution in the future, I, but I would bet it's going to be urban, <laughs> uh, just because that's where the people are, and, uh, and that's where the centers of power are. 
uh, and that it, 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 you know going off to the countryside is is a it's a harder process today, uh, especially given drones and all sorts of other you know technological innovations which make rural revolution also you know more difficult. Well, that's a, an excellent note to end on. Um, we're at time, so I just want to just end by thanking Mark very much for, for making the trip, um, coming to an in-person talk. Uh, you should put your slide back up with the uh, discount code. Oh, uh, um, yes. This is, uh, there's a lot more to, to, to be read and a lot more to, to, to learn. So 30% thir thir oh, okay. off. This is your, uh, uh, your, your marketing office will, uh, will be unhappy with you. if you don't. There we are. There it is. There's, our, there's, our, there's your discount. Um, P289. Right. P289, capital P, I guess. I don't know if it's case sensitive. Um, but thanks very much to Mark. Thanks to Liz Malinkin for organizing. Um, we've missed Derek Groom here today. He's off running the Boston Marathon. Uh, normally, his, uh, he would be taking care of these things. So um, it's been a really great year of events here. Um, thanks to everyone who's been you know, regularly turning up on Zoom or in person when we've been able to do so. Very much hope next year we'll be able to do everything in person. Um, so everybody, in the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, hope everyone has a great, great spring and summer. So please join me in thanking Mark Weisinger. Thanks, and thanks for having me.